Welcome to Ark Spooky Tales. Now, there's nothing that we like more in the Wood household than a good ghost story. So tonight, myself and Mr Wood are going to share some scary stories for your Halloween. The Ghoul of Ghoul Wood We Manny walked all alone in Ghoul Wood at midnight. The night was pitch black, for there was no moon and no stars to give light. The ghoul of Ghoul Wood came out of the darkness and stood there in front of Wee Manny, blocking his path. Its eyes burned red, and its long, greasy hair straggled down to its knobbly knees. Its toenails curled up like fish hooks. Drips of blood dribbled from its purple lips as it grinned at Wee Manny, baring its dagger-sharp teeth. Oh, oh, no, 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 not scared of you! Wee Manny stuttered. Well, you should be, Wee Manny, it said. And it ate him. The Shadow by Neil Gaiman It's lonely where I live. An old house, a long way from anywhere. That's why I got a dog. He keeps me company. Last night the moon was full and it cast shadows. We took a shortcut through the woods into the meadow beyond. I let him off the leash to run. He came back, holding something. Drop it, I ordered. And he did. I felt sick. Somebody behind me said, That's mine. Don't turn around. Then the shadow beside me was gone, and my dog whimpered in the moonlight. The Babysitter by Erin Hunter The phone rang, echoing around the white and silver kitchen that was as glossy as a hall of mirrors. Jess was surrounded by a dozen reflections of herself as she went to pick up the handset. Hello? For a moment there was no answer, just the faint sound of someone breathing. Jess thought of her friends laughing as they told her not to accept the babysitting job from someone she'd never even met. They probably live in a creepy old house in the middle of the woods. They didn't. They lived in a top floor loft with a view of the city that made Jess feel like a bird. The white leather sofas smelled of plastic wrapping. Then a little voice said, I'm coming home, before the line clicked off. Was there another child Jess didn't know about? The phone rang again. I'm coming home. Now the voice sounded old, tired and fretful. There was a tap of footsteps, climbing marble stairs, like the ones that led up to the loft. Jess looked down. Something was brushing her leg. It was the phone cord. It had fallen out of the wall. The sound of scratching at the door, like a dog. In her hand, the phone rang. I'm home, rasped the voice, older than sound. Did you wait up? Man Size in Marble by Edith Nesbitt There were two of them, identical and placed on either side of the altar in the village church. Each was a grey marble figure of a knight in full battle armour. With shield and sword at their side they held their hands upwards in everlasting prayer. Their names were long forgotten, but local people told of their reputation as fierce and evil villains guilty of deeds so foul that the house in which they lived, which had stood on the site of our cottage, had been struck by lightning as an act of vengeance from heaven. Despite all this, the riches of their heirs had brought them a place in the church, had looked at the cold hard faces of marble and believed that what I heard could well be true. I should be glad to leave before the end of the month, sir, requested Mrs Dorman, our housekeeper. Was there a problem? I asked. She'd only been with us for the short time since we'd bought the house, about three months altogether. None at all, sir. You've both been most kind, came her answer. I pressed her further, and eventually she sank into her admission. Well, sir, she began, you may have seen in the church, beside the altar, two bodies drawn out, man-size, in marble. 
I told her that since Laura and I had bought the cottage, we often walked up to the church, and we were both familiar with what she described. She continued, Well, they do say that on Halloween, them two bodies get up from their slabs and walks down the aisle in their marble. And as the clock strikes eleven, they walks out of the church door, over the graves, and if it's a wet night, there's the marks of their feet in the morning. Where do they go? I asked in fascination. They come back here, to their old home, sir, and if anyone meets them, But not another word could I get from her, except a stern warning to lock the door early on Halloween. I did not tell Laura of the marble shapes that walked in the night. A legend concerning our house might trouble her. Maybe I would mention it when the time had passed. Soon I ceased to think of the story at all. I never had much faith in the supernatural. Mrs Dorman was due to leave on the Thursday. That day came and went. The Friday passed in the usual way. With Mrs Dorman absent, Laura and I shared the housework in the morning and relaxed in the afternoon. But something was bothering Laura. I'm rather uneasy, she admitted. I'm shivering a great deal and I feel that there's something evil upon us. I reassured her and we sat quietly for a while, taking in the fire. At about half past ten, I decided I would take a late evening walk. I suggested Laura should get some sleep. So I left her in peace. What a night it was. Dark clouds rolled around. It was deathly silent. The church tower stood out against the sky. The bell sounded. Eleven already. I would just take a moment inside before wandering back. Treading the pathway to the church, I was sure I heard footsteps. Echoes of my own, perhaps. Then I noticed the church door was open. Suddenly I remembered the legend of the marble figures. This was the very moment they were supposed to rise up and walk from their slabs. I could do no less than walk up to the altar, and then I could assure myself the legend was nonsense, and inform Mrs Dorman that the figures had slept soundly in the ghostly hour. I stopped short. My heart gave a great leap and nearly choked me, and then it sank sickeningly. The figures were gone. The marble slabs lay bare in the moonlight that shone through the west window. Were they really gone? Or was I mad? I passed my hand over the smooth slabs and felt their flat, unbroken surface. They really were gone. A horror seized me. I tore down the aisle and out of the church. Outside I met a figure in the darkness. Dr Kelly, our neighbour on his way home from visiting a patient. The marble figures have gone from the church, I gasped. I was trembling as I spoke. He broke into a laugh. In a few moments he'd calmed me, suggested we go back and take another look. We headed inside and walked up the aisle. Dr Kelly struck a match. Here they are, he said. You've been dreaming, or drinking, if you don't mind me saying. I opened my eyes. The two shapes lay there. It must have been a trick of the light, I said. He was busy leaning over and looking at the right hand. He struck another match. This hand is broken, he pointed out. And so it was. I was sure it had been intact the last time Laura and I had been there. But now was not the time for thought. Come along, I said, or my wife will be getting anxious. I invited him back for a drink and he accepted. As we walked up the path, bright light streamed out of the open door. I was sure I'd shut it. Had Laura gone out? At first, we did not see her. The window was open, and the draught had set all the candles flaring. I turned to the window, and there she was, in the recess, a look of fear on her face. She'd fallen back against a table. Her body lay half on it, and half on the window seat, with her head hanging down. Her eyes were wide open. But now they saw nothing. What had they last seen to terrify her face into such an expression of horror? I ran to her, cradled her in my arms, 
her hands were tightly clenched. In one of them, she held something fast. When I was quite sure she was dead, I let the doctor open it so that he might see what she held. It was a finger, a grey marble finger. The Dare by Carol Gorman I dare you, Jack said, knock on the door and ask for a drink. Tommy touched his red cap with a shaky hand, climbed the rotted porch steps and knocked. The door creaked open and Tommy stepped inside. Through the lighted window, Jack saw him sit on the couch. He never came out, Jack told his dad later as they approached the dark house. This place has been abandoned for years, his dad said. See? They climbed the steps and pushed open the front door. Their flashlight lit only cobwebs in the empty room. Must have been some other house, his dad said. He'll be home soon. They closed the door behind them. Neither saw the red cap lying in the dusty corner. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving When the Halloween party had slowed down, the fireside talk turned to ghosts. Did you ever hear the headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow? asked Brom Bones. Ichabod Crane nodded his head and said that yes, possibly he had. Brom Bones liked nothing more than to tell a good ghost story, and Sleepy Hollow abounded with such tales, for it held a drowsy, dreamy influence over its people, and they would often talk of nightmares and strange visions. If there was one particular vision that gripped the people of Sleepy Hollow firmly, it was the sight of this headless figure on horseback, hurrying along in the gloom of night as if on the wings of the wind, searching for his lost head high and low. Mostly, he is seen on the dark road to the church, where he transforms into a skeleton before disappearing in a clap of thunder. Brom Bones loved to tell his own story, and brag about the time he'd offered to race the ghostly rider for a bowl of punch, and that he would have beaten him, but when they reached the church bridge, the headless spectre had vanished in a flash of fire. Ichabod laughed nervously at the tale. He'd enjoyed the storytelling, but knew it was past midnight, and he must now face the lonesome highway alone. Ichabod was the new schoolmaster, a tall gangly figure with feet like vargers, narrow shoulders and a body that hung awkwardly out of his clothes. With huge ears and a long snipe of a nose, he was a sight to be seen for sure. He too liked a good ghost story. Yes, there were times when he'd even frightened himself with his own tales. He was a popular character and admired for his stories, not to mention his wonderful singing voice. And oh, what a dancer he was. Ichabod Crane was no ordinary schoolmaster. Now both he and Brom Bones had their eyes fixed on the same girl, young Katerina Van Tassel. And whenever Brom saw the lanky schoolmaster smile upon Katerina, a jealousy stirred inside him. On this particular night, Brom hadn't managed one dance with Katerina. Instead, he'd watched Ichabod whisk her off her feet and sing to her like a lark, and he swore to himself that he would have his revenge. It was when they sat around the fire telling tales that Brom was determined to outdo Ichabod with his stories. Ichabod stepped out into the night. He would have preferred to have stayed around the fire, and a shiver ran through him as he climbed up onto Gunpowder, his trusty horse. He turned and headed for home. As he made his way along the dusty road out of town, he began to sing along to himself, but his voice trembled nervously. Shortly he felt that something, or someone, was upon him. He should have been relieved to find himself in company, but not this time. Through the mist he could just make out the shape of a huge black horse and its rider. It seemed to be following, matching his pace. Ichabod had no relish for this strange midnight companion and urged Gunpowder to walk faster. The stranger quickened his horse also, stayed on his shoulder. Ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk, hoping to lag behind. He 
the other did the same. Ichabod's heart sank. He turned to grasp a glimpse of his midnight companion and was horror-struck to find that not only was he headless, but that he carried his head before him as he rode. His terror rose to desperation. He rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder, hoping to give his companion the slip, but the spectre stayed with him. Away they dashed through the thick and thin, stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long, lank body over his horse's head in the eagerness of his flight. They'd now reached the point where the road forks. Instead of staring off to the right and the comfort of the schoolhouse, Gunpowder, who seemed possessed by a demon, took the opposite turn and plunged headlong downhill. The road led through a sandy hollow, shaded by trees, and ended where the bridge opens the way to a grassy knoll. Here was where the church stood. Just as Ichabod got halfway through the hollow, the girths of the saddle gave way and he felt it slip under him. He could only save himself by grasping the horse's neck. Ichabod held on for dear life. Hearing the saddle being trampled underfoot and remembering Brom's story, he knew that he needed only to hang on until he reached the church bridge before his companion would disappear. Just then, he felt the horseman grow even closer. He fancied he could feel the horse's hot breath down the nape of his neck. As Gunpowder cantered over the bridge, Ichabod risked a glimpse behind him to see if his companion would truly disappear. As he did so, the ghostly horseman took his severed head and hurled it towards him. Ichabod took the full force of the missile and tumbled headlong into the dust. The next day, old gunpowder was found quietly cropping the grass near the bridge. At his feet lay Ichabod's hat and the remains of a shattered pumpkin. Poor old Ichabod never to be seen again. Shortly after, Catherine Van Tassel married Brom Bones, and some say that he had more to do with the outcome of this story than he reckons. Others think they know him better, except perhaps the Brom Bones. Thank you for watching and listening to our ghost stories tonight. Um, we've been reading stories from um, Half Minute Horrors, a collection of very short ghost stories. From The Orchard Book of Goblins, Ghouls and Ghosts by Martin Waddell. Um, we've read a few from Dust and Bones, which is ten ghost stories um, adapted by and written by Chris Mould. And if you fancy um, a story about ghosts where the ghosts are not scary, they're very lovely, then we also recommend that you read this book, which is The Ghost Library by David Melling. Thanks. Good night. Mm -hmm.